Right, you ready then? Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome back, Kreuzer. It's only Britain's Hidden History number 93, and they said it would never last. Right, you can't quite see. We've got Xavier on keyboards. Hang on. Let's just swing it around just for a second. In his latch. <laughs> never mind, hello. Play the piano. Come on, you. Go, oh, hello, rights. Hello, everyone. Ooh, Magpie67. Hello, Magpie. New name for me. You're first up on the list. Uh, on Theo's show, back on the day. Yes, Theo's show was great. On the edge. That's it. Can you see his. Uh, can't quite see. Uh, play, play. He's gone. Oh, there we go. Oh, well, that went really well, didn't it? Savvy making his big keyboard debut and he's disappeared. What happened? I finished. Just play. Oh, that was it. Oh, right. I thought you'd do the Rocky thing. Oh, Leon was doing How's it. Oi, 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 Todd Tig. Hello, David. All the way over in... <laughs> all the way over in Germany. Good Abend. Yeah, we had a great chat. So I'll show you all about that in a second. Uh, Kreuzer. Oh, interesting spelling of Kreuzer. I assure you, I do an evening all. Hope everyone's doing okay, despite the never-ending saga. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no politics here, in case you're new to the programme. I'm staying all the way from politics, and I have got a bit close lately, and I'm going to say, well, away again, okay? So I just want to remind people, I'm going to do a thing tonight as well, talking about where the where the channel goes, you know, what's the kind of, uh, the point of the channel, what's the direction, what kind of stuff we're going to talk about, which is our hidden history. Are we focusing on the written records? I mean, primarily, this is the work of Wilson and Blackett, if you know those and you're new to this channel, you're going to love it because we do lots about them. But also other history that's been around. Old records. i got a beautiful old new book here. Uh, I'm just going to talk about that a second. A new old book. <laughs> new, new to my collection. A very old book. Gary Taylor. He's always there. I think it's every show since this began. Right. Um, yeah, thank you, Zavi. That was a very short piece of music then. We, we'll try some more music a bit later. Good evening, Marcel. In Ad's world. Oh, that'll be Leon or Arnie. Graham. Hello, Graham. Right. Evening, Myrig. Right. Got loads of good stuff tonight. Cold and blowy in Scotland. Oh, yes. I hope it's getting easier in Canada as well. Good to see Patricia online. Alan. Loads of people online. Wow. Fantastic. Hello, Suzanne. Neil. Wow. And it's gone. Monica. Hello, Monica. Monica and I finally had our online chat. So we finally got to speak. Paula from USA. Hello. So I'll talk a little bit about Monica and the book. And I could just go to edit that and put it up. We sort of record it in stages. Just need to glue it together. Hey, Lego's there. And that will go. Sherry Eyes. Arnie, we need more music. Yeah, Arnie's only just got back. He's been out to the cinema. So we'll have to... I haven't even really got your violin out yet. Have you on? It's yeah, worn out, poor thing. A rugby match this morning as well. You met Theo, John. Wow. And, uh, well, if you meet him again, send him my uh, very best wishes. And if he ever wants me to come on his show, I would be delighted. I thought, On the Edge with Theo, his interview with Alan is just brilliant. Uh, I imagine everyone on here has seen it. I mean, it's st <laughs> he's such a nice top bloke. Because you can see at the beginning, I think he starts off thinking, you know, uh, or if he's just an act or whatever, but uh, the way he does it, it's so good. I think he's, uh, he's just an ins inspiration to anyone who interviews people. He's like, yeah, you're trying to say there's like two Arthurs, and where's all this come from? And he's got that nice jovial talk, and you can see as it goes on, you can see, hang on a second, I can see something in this. This is all, this is really good, you know. This is how, uh, uh, yeah, this is true. We do have a history, and there are records, and it all makes sense. Dark Commission, been watching since the first show, first time posting. We'll post away. Hello, Dark Commission. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, and thank you. I had a lot of messages uh, and some interesting letters as well. So we'll do a little bit about that. Um, we're going to crack on. Right, okay. Let's have a look. I'm going to put a few bits and pieces on the screen. And uh, just to say, yeah, if you are, <laughs> if, if you're, uh, just, just to welcome everybody on board. If it's your first time, then, then to put it in a nutshell, in every history, right, okay, it's not just like the modern government or Britain or Wales particularly or England, Scotland. All these countries involved in this particular rewrite. Governments have always done this. I think there's been a, a special on Taiwan, actually, because I was over in Taiwan a couple of years ago. And i would just say a few words about it now, is that uh, what was um, 
what's great about Taiwan is you can see a very similar thing to what's happened to most histories, including British history, really condensed into a sort of microcosm that we can follow. Because uh, that's where Angie's from. And her, her father is like a sort of, uh, um, well, uh, sadly, he, he passed away recently. And he was a, a living part of history. Because he was from mainland China. And he, uh, while very young, was involved in the whole uh, Mao Zedong risings and Chiang Kai-shek, you know, all that stuff that was taking place, well, it started in World War II, really. And he was very young, and he became, um, uh, what's, what's the word, attached, attached to uh, Chiang Kai-shek's army, which was the old government. And then the politics were incredibly complicated, about uh, how Mao came into power and all I got loads of books on Mao too. whole thing on Chinese history is brilliant or Taiwan history anyway and Taiwan history is one of those things where after um, I'd say after a year or two of studying it I thought I was an expert and really had it nailed and then after sort of seven or eight years of looking after it you realize there's even more layers it's very complicated but what you can see and I took a lot of videos of when I was over there which I need to put together into a film sometime is how the history's been written uh, a number of times very quickly. For example, uh, a lot there, first of all, there's the original, um, you know, the, uh, the Dutch settlement and the development and the spice trading and the wars of Britain, all that kind of stuff, but not, not so important. But Japan took the island at one point, and this is a really sore point because Japan was quite a brutal occupation, but they also built... You know, uh, runways, roads, hospitals, this kind of thing. So it's it's definitely a big part of the history, but um, not one that's really appreciated for nationalistic reasons. Now, at the end of the... Uh, I don't know why it's like diversion from British history here, but you've got a strange situation in China, as Taiwan was always considered part of China. And when the war was... Uh, Chiang Kai-shek was clearly on the losing team, they took the, the sort of cr equivalent of the crown jewels, all that kind of stuff, was whisked out to Taiwan for safekeeping. And they moved the capital to Taiwan. So you had this very strange situation where Taiwan, uh, and, and technically, from its constitution, still claims to be the capital of all of China. And it, when it used to meet its parliaments and stuff, it would have empty seats for different provinces in the mainland. And, of course, China claims that Taiwan is a, a rogue state. So what you see there, if you go there, is the cult uh, of uh, Chiang Kai-shek was built to create this, uh, this demigod. You know, this, well, it was a cult. So it was loads of statues of Chiang Kai-shek. His memorial is, is just brilliant. I mean, it's amazing. Beautiful building. And you've got these fantastic-looking uh, soldiers who were doing uh, the constant drill, a little bit like Arlington Cemetery in America. There's a Taiwan equivalent. You can see them marching back and forth, doing this drill. And I got I got one little clip of video, which i got to share. I'll dig it out, which is so funny, because they're, we're with them. We, we end up queuing up with them, because you have to go up in the lift to get to the, the actual tomb part where they march. And you can see a bunch of the soldiers all trying to get into the lift, and they sort of just sort of hit the lift at the same time. They don't quite make it. And you got these shiny silver helmets, all the stuff. It's it's very funny. Well, it's hit by humour anyway. It's like the, the, the this massive war machine stopped because you can't get through the lift doors. It, anyway, so all that kind of stuff. And at the moment now, it's been so the history all got changed. Like everything started from Chiang Kai Shek, and in China, you got Maoism. Uh, everything going back to year zero, and this is when they start the history. So all that history gets changed. And in Taiwan, it's been a movement. Of, back away from Chiang Kai-shek, because he's, I, actually I'm not sure when he died, but it's been quite a while, and it's sort of trying to write him back out of history. So a lot of the things which were in the capital, Taipei, have been moved out, and they were going to try and move the museum, and try and move the, set the uh, memorials, and move them away, so they're less visible, so you don't see the statues all the time. And, and the history of the last 40, 50 years, is being rewritten again to suit the current agenda. So I'll do more on that at some point. I'll do a little special report, as it were. 
and because uh, I I think sometimes people uh, find very I know I did <laughs> so it's not just being patronising I find it difficult to think that this kind of rewriting that would go on in Britain we just don't think these kind of things happen where clearly they did and the big moment seems to be uh, the 1688 which is effectively a coup it was a military coup where the government or the king was the Stuarts were kicked out and then we had William and then Mary and all these people and then the Hanoverians and they were deeply unpopular deeply deeply unpopular and revolution was very much in the air and it was necessity political necessity to dampen national spirit rewrite the history uh, re remove this um, proud history and replace it with something uh, where the English become Germans the Welsh Scots and Irish become Celts everyone's just primitive barbarians and there's no history so people have got less to identify with and easier to uh, govern so that's in a nutshell and I'm going to do a little bit about the Celtic myths it keeps coming up so I know we've touched on it before we're going to have a crack through so it's a bit lighter this week it's been a bit heavy the last couple of weeks last week was was good but at the end of it, I thought my goodness it felt like a bit like um, I felt like uh, we just had like a classroom lesson or something that's not the idea it is a Sunday evening at the end of the day it's got to be a bit of fun and quick light hearted are you going to get your violin ready as well so we can have some music okay, yeah, how about that the keyboard's not working on this the keyboard's not working on the computer. Okay, all right. Well, I can see the comments. That's okay. I know you like to have the cars running around in the background. What? <laughs> I'm just winding up. All right, now I just want to comment. All right, okay. He's had a long day, okay. Tough game of rugby this morning. Played up against Porth. Came second in that one. But Leon and Zavi won their game. So there you go. All right, excuse me. Sniffing. All right, so i got some random news stories, okay? Let's start off with some random news stories. Uh, here's one. Uh, which I'll jump onto the website in a second. It's actually a bit old, this, but it came up. Oh, no, I haven't put who put this up on our... Um, I do know who put it up. Ah! Sorry, I do apologise. I like to... If you've got any stories or things you found in the news, it'd be interesting, tie in what we're doing, please send them up, and, and I'll put them up. Uh, we've got a new member on the group who's posted quite a bit, and I will just say, there we go, thank you for putting that up. Anyway... So our Druid Grove has taken a great interest in the... It's not a new one. It's 2014, so almost eight years ago. <clears throat> what, I was, what I want to talk about quickly was not so much the stuff they found, but it's this idea here, which is Wiltshire Town has been confirmed... Can I highlight this? No, I can't. Ooh, as the longest continuous settlement in the United Kingdom, Amesbury, including Stonehenge, has been continually occupied since... 8,820 BC, so for 10,000 years. And the question is, all right, the news also confirmed, uh, following an archaeological dig, which also unearthed evidence of frogs' legs being eaten in, eight, in Britain 8,000 years before France. I don't know when, how we know when France started, but there you go. Or since the country, <laughs> since the country was formed. Amesbury's place in history has now been recognised in the Guinness Book of Records. Well, there we are, it must be true then. David Jackson, University of Buckingham, said the site blows the lid off Neolithic revolution in a number of ways. It provides evidence of people staying put, clearing land, building, and presumably worshipping and monuments and blah, blah, blah. All right, so there's more about that. I saw I was a bit slow putting the links up last week. I will put this link up. But you get the gist of it, okay? Without us going to the website. Now, what I want to get into, first of all, it's this 8,000 years BC or 10,000 years ago. We had another story this week, which is supposed to be 50, 60,000 years ago. These numbers, and I'm going to come back to them. I used to talk a lot about this, but not for a while. Is this, We dig into it, <laughs> excuse the pun with it being a dig. There's no real... Uh, there's no real, well, no real science behind them. There's, there's a lot of assumptions. And what, what tends to happen is you start off with a model and then you have to make the model work. And one of the ways you make, and if things don't fit, you move them back further and further and further. So one, for example, yeah, is, is sediments. Where you think, okay, well, if, um, if we get, say, a millimeter of, millimeter of sediment in a year, 10 years is 10 millimeters, 
a hundred years is going to be ten centimeters, you know, and on and on you go. So you say, well, everyone, if it's two meters, therefore that's two hundred years or two thousand years, whatever the maths works out. It, it doesn't, but the truth is, it doesn't work like that. The way, for example, with, with sediments work, you might get a huge storm or something, and make deposits a thousand years worth. And then the next few years, it might actually get a bit taken off or nothing happens. And this is where you come to one of the big debates in uh, history, particularly for dating older sites. And that is all to do with the idea of gradualism versus catastrophism. If you haven't heard these terms, I, I, I think I might do a full thing on it next week. It's the, I keep saying that, they're not doing things, don't I? Because it'd be a nice change. Hang on for next week, catastrophism, which I can never spell, and that's for 94. The, the idea is, one school of thought is things happen gradually, 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 gradually. And the other one is you get sudden massive shocks to the system, like you get a big storm, or um, more specifically, if you look at the work of Velikovsky, uh, oh, we have a break in a minute, I'm not, not right now, yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, is that you'll get uh, disturbances like comets, other planets come into the Earth, massive jolts. The whole concept of a universe going round and round and round and round, like uh, described by the sort of the Newtonian clock or clockwork system, doesn't stand up to the evidence, at least according to people like Velikovsky and Wilson and Blackett, who tie in a lot into Velikovsky's work, and so do I. And I think if people read it, it's really, really compelling. But of course, he didn't fit the mould, even though he's friends with Einstein. Uh, incredibly, he was, he was editing these magazines, he was the top guy. Once he went outside the fold and said, whoa, all these dates and that are completely wrong, and history is much shorter, and he explains things like how coal is made, stuff like this, he was cast out. Uh, his uh, the Other academics put pressure on um, his publisher to stop publishing his books which actually worked out well, because he had to go to another more mainstream publisher and he sold millions of copies, and it was huge for a while. And then it just got left to be forgotten over time. Omnipotence. <laughs> That's my new word, and I've forgotten it again. Omnipotence. It's a Fomenko. I thought Fomenko was writing. Okay, so this is one of those situations, in my view. You've got no way of saying this is 10,000 years old, or 20, or 50, or 60. But they I don't want to be too cruel, but they're almost random numbers because there's no specific science to back it. And what tends to happen, and I've dug and dug and dug, <laughs> that pun again, to try and find out from these, how do you get that date? And it, it's it's just a case of, well, you sort of estimate a date on one site and it's got a certain piece in it. And that piece looks a bit like this piece. Therefore, those two must be about the same date. It, you'd be amazed how wishy-washy it is. And then what it does is make a big difference. For example, uh, we've got a contradiction. Places like Stonehenge, where some people would say, you know, it's tens of thousands of years old. And then you've got uh, the sort of things we look at with the migrations or the British history. Say the Britons didn't turn up until 2000 BC would be very, very early, 16, 1700 BC. So what was happening before they got there? According to the Welsh triads and their records, Stonehenge wasn't built until 3400 AD, not BC, AD. And it was moved again about 480s. And one of the things Wilson and Blackett do is show that this seems to have tied in with comet tracking and it's astronomical. So we're, we're, we're talking miles apart, miles apart on these things. We've got what the historical record tells us, what you can try and work out. Or you have, uh, I don't know, I mean, it's a, a different way of looking at it, let's put it that way. Now, one of the other areas, which is very important to what we're doing, it ties in with Velikovsky's work, is how long ago was the Ice Age? Was there an Ice Age? And it makes a very compelling argument that the physics doesn't work. There was no way you could have an ice ball or snowball world. The whole world couldn't be an Ice Age. What's far more likely is the poles moving, and as they shift, the freezing zone on the planet shifts with them. 
whatever shape of planet, all right? Let's keep that out of it. The cold areas. So you've got the evidence for places like uh, Northern Europe, including Britain, being frozen up, and that ice would have receded, but that wouldn't have happened until about 2000 BC. So if something was much older than that, it would have been under the ice for a few thousand years, or wherever long that particular shift lasted, probably a few thousand years. So if something was earlier, we've got no idea who that was, and presumably they'd have been driven out by the climate change. And then, as the ice retreated, we got the migrations back into Britain. So a structure like Stonehenge, would it have survived an ice age? Don't know, seems unlikely. So there you go. So it's a kind of thinking, looking at different ways of dating and stuff like that. All right. So I've got to, you've got to tune in mind, Arnie. What do you oh, want? Oh, wait for a break. Wait for a suggestions, break. Taking suggestions. Oh, right, all right, suggestions. Arnie's going to follow the comments. If you've got a yeah. song, he's got a good chance of knowing. That'd be good. <laughs> uh, any national anthems? Anything like that? Oh, right. National anthems. Arnie's feeling confident tonight. Yes. Yes, he was old Canada last week. We did. So um, there you go. Make of that like what you God will. God save the Queen. After God save the Queen. After yesterday. Oh, thanks. Yes, no one's mentioned the rugby yet, right, in the comments. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm over it. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> right. So there we go. So anyway, this, this uh, on screen, don't need me to hold it up as well. You can see there, there's this wonderful new book by Monica. So Monica's in the group. Mon Mona Wa Wallflower. No, is it Wallflower? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Anyway, put the name up on there. So thank you for joining us again. Uh, Monica got a group on Facebook. It's been running since 2014, I think. Uh, something like that. Long time. And this amazing project is a summary of all the... Uh, well, not all. I mean, you couldn't possibly do all, but it's a summary of their Arthurian stuff done by Wilson and Blackett. And it covers a vast uh, array. And I'm enjoying reading it. I've even gone out and bought myself a German dictionary. Ta da! To help me get back into my German. I used to be quite good at German, but if you don't use it, you lose it in languages. So look out for that video during the week, and you'll see everything about what's in this book. And we have a good chat, and a few issues come up while we're talking as well. Uh, different ideas about things, about history, stuff like that. So don't uh, just watch it for the book, watch it for the chat, and get to see Monica as well. And David, who is the, <laughs> not only the model on the front cover of the book, he also speaks uh, German and English and was a good translator between us. So thank you very much for that. So if you're looking for the book here, you can get it on this email address if you want a hardback copy, or, and I will put these links in the description, Sorry, I haven't done it already. There we are, eleven pounds only. You can have the um, Google Books version where you can look at it on your screen. Okay, it's a beautiful book, and I highly recommend it, uh, especially if you speak German. <laughs> it probably will help if you speak German, or if like me, you're going to work your way through it with a dictionary. Right. Oh yeah. So, a bit like I was talking about direction of this channel. Okay. Right. Let's come back to me a second. Okay. Oh, look at this. Look at this. You see? Look at that. Mm. It's the kind of thing my parents had in their house. So in my parents' old house at the moment. So those people sent me letters. I do apologise for slow replies. Didn't realise it. We're having uh, our old house done up a bit and the workers there had been putting all the letters safe on a shelf, which we didn't notice until the other day. So I got letters from two or three weeks ago. So I've done a lot of letter reading this week. Look at that there. Isn't that lovely? Look at that, Charles and Diana, wow, yeah, 1981. So I'm not some, uh, I haven't always been a radical, <laughs> I was brought up on uh, watching uh, Changing the Guard and my dad's in the RAF and let's look at the royal wedding and all that kind of thing. I was on, um, we went over to an army camp in Germany to watch that. Wow, where's the time gone, eh? But anyway, that's another story. Uh, and I've, oh yeah, direction of the channel. <laughs> Right now, I've quite a few, I've had quite a lot of um, uh, uh, advice and suggestions and concerns about the content of Britain's hidden history, okay? Which is why, partly on the introduction, I want to re emphasize this is about the written, uh, the recorded British history, recorded on stones, genealogies, manuscripts, books. So it's not just history books. It's those sources. And then following the trail of the Britons back through the migration route, looking at the carved stones, how Etruscan can be read, read uh, Phrygian, all the way back to reading uh, hieroglyphs, 
following the migrations over to America, where you can read what's on the caves there. You can read the inscribed stones. Uh, the ones, I suppose, native stones actually read in Welsh, which is which is what a lot of the King Arthur conspiracy book is about, at least volume two. And that's what the channel is about. All right. Now, <laughs> one of the problems we have, if, if we just do uh, only Wilson and Blackett work the whole time, although it's vast, and I always like to bring in a bit of Velikovsky and Fomenko, because I think they directly contribute to the subject very closely and raise some issues. But I'm also interested, we need to bring more people in with other areas of interest that might get them involved and realise what a nice community we've got and friendly, constructive chats we have and try and look at issues which uh, most places might be quite close to. All right. Now, just to emphasise, though, these are just of interest. Like, I've got, when I was inquiring minds, I find loads of things of interest, and I think people like to follow me stumbling, staggering, blindly walking through a new subject. Things I don't know anything about, which are not strictly Britain's hidden history. So it's things like, uh, I've been fascinated by the dowsing. Um, we've had Luke doing his, you know, the legal interpretations of the Bible. We got a few other bits and pieces, but uh, the flat Earth stuff, because of course Martin Leaker, who I'll be with tomorrow. <laughs> but this channel is not promoting flat Earth particularly, okay, or any anyway, really. It's just um, I'm very open to the idea, but that's not what the channel's about. So I just wanted to reassure people: the core message is the history and going back, right back, with the written records and what we're looking at, and following the migrations and seeing what our history used to be. All right, so I just want to uh, reassure, reassure people who are a bit concerned we're going off in other directions, and I do do have a wandering mind, so pull me back in again. But also, I want this a group thing. It's not just about my views. So please, on the comments here, which I can't quite see, they're too far away. There we go. Thank you. So I mean, I like to get feedback on there. People got things they like to have covered or don't think should be on the channel. Just send me an email if you don't want to do it publicly, or I'll drop me a letter, like some people have done. So thank you very much for the letters. I can see a lot of thought has gone into them. They're very sincere and very much appreciated. And I'm opening to... Um, so I'm waiting now for the catch-up. Ross, your temperament and candour is wonderful. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Brad. Uh, I try my best not to get too wound up by things. <laughs> candour. Yeah, I am honest. That's one thing I will tell you. I am. I am... Yeah, I will tell you what I think. There we go. All right, so uh, this is one of David didn't really necessarily want this push, but I'd like you to look at look at David Saucemann Bach. Uh, one of the things on the group I want to do more of, which is not really uh, directly history, is get more live music on. All right, we got a lot of talented people in the group, so if you do music, please send a video in. Uh, homemade music we're talking about here, written yourself, not just cover versions. Homemade music, and let's just create this nice atmosphere because I don't know I'm fine but the problem I've got uh, before I go into that too much the other, the other problem I've got at the moment I don't know if you share this problem and I'm in danger of getting critical because I'm trying to keep the politics off it completely all right it's really important but I'm finding it really difficult to find anything to watch I'm just finding it so difficult I, f I feel that uh, any um, even just watching a football game or something there's there's this constant uh you know, I'm going to have to call it propaganda, because what it is, isn't it? But it's constant uh, preaching or messaging about certain viewpoints and ideologies, whatever you want to watch, or listen to on the radio, or anything like that. It's getting increasingly difficult just to be able to have an open, frank discussion about different things. So I do tend to draw stuff in, partly for my own uh, <laughs> amusement as well, because uh, I find it difficult. And I like to hear what people have to say. Oh, yeah, that was the other thing I meant to mention. Sorry, yes. So when I interview people on this channel, and i got quite a few interviews lined up with people who aren't directly related to this, okay? Um, my, my, I see my role a little bit like um, when we were talking about The Edge earlier, um, is to give the person who is the guest a platform to present their position as best they can, and to help them if I can, you know, nudge them along and that kind of stuff. It's not to be seen, though, as an endorsement by me, or that I particularly believe a position. 
we had quite a variety of people like Robert Langdon with his ideas about the water levels and the boats and that kind of thing. And we got Luke with the Bible stuff. So we got um, quite a few different things, all right? But I think my view is to give people a platform and then have a think about it and come back and ask questions and see what you think. And that's where we go, all right? So uh, and just a quick one here, please. Dave's been a great support of the channel from the beginning. And I like brilliant songs, so I'll just go a quick plug. Uh, give it a try and listen to these songs. Very good, bit different. All right, so here's the one. <laughs> After saying all that, uh, now this isn't my conference by any means. This is Martin Leaker, and a lot of people have come across from Martin's fantastic channel, which I really enjoy. It's one of the things I do watch because they're. Um, I I don't know what to think about it. I, I'm mind blown. It's it's different to the sort of history we do here, but it it does ask some amazing questions. And tomorrow I'm like a guest. I'm just a guest. All right. I'm not uh, promoting the flat earth particularly, anything like that. And tomorrow, uh, from tomorrow morning, I will be, um, you have to get tickets for it, but uh, you can, I'm sure you can pay on the, on the, on the, there's not even a door, we're in a park, so you can pay, pay at the tree, or pay through the, pay at the temple or something. I'm going to be, if you are available, want to come along tomorrow morning at 10.30 at, um, Oh, God, the stones in the Butte Park. If you go to Butte Park, and I will be walking over to uh, Blackfriars, which is in Butte, Butte Park, right next to Cardiff Castle. And I'll be speaking there for a little while about um, the Bishop of Bethlehem's grave, Joseph of Arimathea's grave, uh, why Blackfriars is there, the connection with St. Mary's, that kind of thing. And then uh, Martin... I don't know who else will be leading off on a walk around other historical places of interest around Cardiff. So it's a very interesting walk. Hang on, I should just do a little bit of a... I, I did have all these videos lined up, and I haven't shown any of them yet. <laughs> just, uh, all right, uh, hang on. Oh, God, that's the one I wanted to talk about. All oh, right. Okay, sorry, Mark, I'm not going to be able to plug you just yet on this time. But if you look for that, I'm sure you'll find it. Uh, go to Martin's channel, look for the links, type in, hang on, type that in, The Holy Grail, The Great Reset, UK Tour, and I'll put the tour dates up, and this is the link, all right, if you can uh, find that in the description, <laughs> all that lot, but if you go to Holistic Media, and then you might want to do that, all right, might be an uh, interesting thing to do, okay, because he is very, very entertaining, it's very interesting, I have to say, not much of it matches my ideas on the history, but I'm struggling to find answers for a lot of the things he claims. And I can't be fairer than that, can I? So there you go. Right, this is just one quick one. Yeah, I just, I'm not going to go into radiocarbon dating right now, okay? But I do want to give an idea, because one of the... I'm going to read some comments. Let's catch up with some comments a minute. There's a section of Graham Hancock's website devoted to third-party articles. Would be a good, I think, to write for it. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, okay, have uh, what else we got here? It's called NWO. Oh, God, yeah, no world order. Yeah, all right, let's not try to get into all that. Uh, that's what they were teaching the Open University years ago. No one ever said the whole world was frozen. Oh, good, good. Well, they call it an ice age. So what do you mean by an ice age? Wh which bits were ice aged? So that's a good one to discuss, Amelia. Thank you. How far will the walk be, Ross? I can make the Butte Park part, not sure, after. Um, I don't think it's going to be that that arduous. I mean, as far, as far as I understand it, it's going to be um, mostly standing around Butte Park in the morning and then uh, I'm going to walk across. Ah, so I, didn't really, I should have paid more attention in the briefing. Oh, Martin, if you're there, type on there. Where are we going? But it's more or less down down there. It's not be that far. I know there's some people with uh, mobility issues, a couple of wheelchairs. And I'm going to go down St. Mary Street. Uh, and that's pretty much it. And then the afternoon is meeting again then to go to um, uh, Cardiff Bay and around the docks and look at like where the first million pound deal was done and the first million pound check and down the coal exchange, all those areas. I'm not sure if I'm going to be there for the whole thing, um, but uh, yeah, give me I'll give you give me a call tomorrow morning, Kay, or, or later, and we can, uh, um, and then we can uh, 
meet up, I'll give you a lift or something if we need to, okay? Okay, thank you very much. All the nice comments on there. I, uh, right, okay. Right, so I want to show just quickly on here now. How many people actually know what IntCal20 is even? All right, you have to check these things. Uh, I just want to say there's a few words. I'm not going to go into the whole thing because I, I could talk for hours and hours about uh, this is my pet subject for like dating systems. This is very much where physics and chemistry and history cross and like, they're my favorite subjects. Right. When you talk, when you see a lot of articles, all I want to do is burst this little bubble quickly. They will say, oh yeah, we know it's this because it's been radiocarbon dated. All right, a RCD. And it could be other, it's not just carbon, it's other um, radioactive or decaying elements. And uh, the principle, I'm sure you know the principle, as you look down here, we're looking at the concentration of 14. Now, if you look at carbon molecules, it's it's 12 is the carbon number, okay? Six protons, six neutrons, atomic weight 12. Now, you get isotopes, whereby it's the same element. It's going to be a chemistry lesson. I'm not, actually, I'm not so good at chemistry, physics, I bet, right? You get two extras on there, makes it 14. It wants to shake these two off and become 12 again, because that's its stable form. Why these extra two come on is a no whole subject by itself. And I say one of the fundamental flaws in carbon dating is why and how that happens. <laughs> it's not, not simple as uh, no one really has nailed that down exactly. So what you do, the idea is over time, the 14, these extras will peel off and you're left with the 12s. And the theory is, because it's in the air, Living things, whether it be a tree or a human, will breathe it in, and that 14 will be present in all our uh, bones and bits and all that. And when we die, as we decompose, the 14, these little twos will fly off and we're left with the 12s. So I'll we'll try and put that, hopefully that makes sense. In an ideal, lovely world, then, you get this lovely curve. So living creatures, carbon 14 level is, um, think of an easy number, Ross, 64. Then every... 2,000 years, wherever it is, for the element you're looking at, carbon or something. Then after 1,000 years, that 64 will half to 32, then half to 16, then 8. You know, you get that nice curve. So the theory by Libby back in the 50s is if you pick your point and measure the relative number of 14s to 12s, so really counting these extra 2s, you can work out how old something is. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. Well, it certainly hasn't so far anyway. You don't know what the carbon-14 level is to begin with. You don't know if it degrades in a uniform way. You know, is it consistent? Um, one thing which they, which they dread and messes up everything, can 14 get added back in? That's a problem. The, the starting 14 is a real issue. There's examples where they've taken living things, right? Actually living things that are alive now. Carbon dated them to like 700 years in the future. Because for some reason, that particular, um, what was it, a snail or something, had a really high carbon-14. And then they found something a few hundred years old, uh, a, a castle in England, and dated it 7,000 years old. For some reason, very low carbon-14. Wood is a particular nightmare. You can cut a tree down, you might not use it for, well, you might use it for small jobs, you might season it, it might get reused. The wood could be 100 years old before we even start. So you might be surprised to know that the usual, <laughs> the usual margin of error is a few thousand years on carbon dating. So when people say, ah, oh, it's Roman or this, or it's first century, second century, because of carbon dating, it, it, it's, 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 it's wild, wildly uh, overconfident, okay? So I just want to show this quickly, because I, I was an article I wanted to show about, um, didn't get it already, I'll talk briefly about it, there's a, there's a settlement in Nova Scotia in uh, north of America, Bob Morgan's been doing the research on it, Bob is fantastic, more Bob on the show soon, he's done some amazing new research, one of which is what's considered to be a Viking settlement, dated to the 1000 AD, they're shifting it around, because they've improved again, we're now on to calibration curve, <laughs> Number 20, effectively. All right, it's, it's what they have to do is um, every few years they say, this is perfect, we've got carbon dating, we know the dates of everything, and then they discover some 
obvious example where it just does not work at all and it's miles out. So they have to re recalibrate. Does this sound like something else you know about? There's another, so basically it's a model. You create a model and you got to fit into the model. Models and numbers are the, the tyranny of our age, I would say. When I was doing my degree in maths and stats, I could see, I was being taught this modeling and how it's going to work and how it's going to be able to make social changes and predictions and, <laughs> and aid with policy, you know, the kind of thing. And it's nonsense, all right? It's just nonsense. Because you can you can make the... It's all about what you put in the parameters, same as everything else, all right? Gigo, garbage in, garbage out. It's even worse because you can change how the data works. So what you have again then is based on tree rings and all this kind of stuff. So read up about this. I don't want to put you off. <laughs> I hope I haven't. I'm going to put... It's, it's good fun, actually. It's a good fun subject. Another term you hear is Gaussian distribution. I'm throwing these names in because I don't want people to be intimidated or scared by them, all right? People say, oh, it's Gaussian. It's radiocarbon dating. It's dendrochronology. It's counting tree rings. Which, by the way, another thing you can't really do. Try it. Get an old piece of wood and try and count the rings. <laughs> it's almost impossible. So what they do, they apply... They've got Gaussian distribution methods and there's others. There's other names. Uh, what's the latest one they started using? Anyway, the whole point of them is you take all these dots that are pretty random and you try and make them into a curve or a line of best fit. And then they tell you, because of that, they've got the hang of it. And they throw a load of numbers at you like this. Standard deviations. All these things where people, I'm sure, it, right now are going, ah, they'll say standard deviations on a Sunday evening. Ah, 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 ah. I might have a bit of a reaction sometimes. 95% confidence intervals, all this kind of thing. Don't let it bother you. What this means is we don't really know. So we're going to try and make a curve fit and work from that. So when they talk about, so if you look at this little blue curve here, can you see that on the screen? I think you can. So what they're really saying, the answer could be all the way over here on the far left. And the answer, because there's only one right answer, don't forget. If you're saying a certain site is so many years old, it's only one answer that's correct. All the other answers are wrong. So say the answer happened to be on this end, up here, within the curve, all these other predictions in here are all wrong. They're all wrong. They can't all be right. Okay? Same this end. And from one end to the other end, they always make it the same shape and they make it to a one and lots of tricks they do. Between this end and this end, well, it'll depend. It could be a thousand years. It could be all sorts of things. Wherever they want to put the numbers, really. So please be aware of this, all this kind of stuff. Really scary and everything, all right? It's not really. <laughs> okay, it's a little bit of a scam in my view. Especially when it comes to tree rings and that. Because what they do, you would think, if you asked anyone about dendrochronology, do you know what it is? Yes, I do. They get a piece of wood and they look at the pattern. And in a good year, you might get a thick, see that's a thick ring. And then it's a really rubbish year, so we got a little bit thinner. They've got a thin ring. And then they have these things called wobbly rings because of maybe solar activity. So you've got a pattern. So there's your pattern. So what I might do now, I might say, all right, this is four wide, five wide, two wide, one wide, five wide, four wide. Just give them, measure them, give them numbers. And so you've now got a series of numbers. So if it worked perfectly, anytime you find a bit of wood, you just look at the rings and the numbers are five, four, two, one, one, two, one. Oh, hang on. Here's my list of all the numbers from now to 10,000 years ago. Where does that series of numbers appear? There. That must be the age. You know, let me work out it's the newest part, the oldest part. Even that doesn't work. You can only get, it could be almost anywhere on the line. So you apply another statistical method to show which is most likely. So really, it, it, don't be freaked out by these things, all right? Although I've probably freaked out everyone. Has <laughs> everyone switched off yet? That's enough stats for a Sunday evening. Thank you very much. But I'm going to talk more about that and why it's uh, why radio carbon dating is broken, okay? That definitely doesn't work. You know, 20th revision here. And it'll be another one in another few years. And Oh, yeah, sorry. I should explain how they get those just to just uh, not leave you hanging like that, just quickly. So if I've got a curve like this, 
All right. This is my what I think the curve is. I don't know where on the curve we are because everything does not start with the same carbon-14. It just doesn't. So there's all sorts of theories then. Well, maybe there's a time in the past when there's more carbon-14. Maybe carbon-14 changes called the sun or because it's in a hole or because of whatever, whatever, whatever. So you end up, hang on, is there a curve here somewhere? Where's the latest curve? Then you have to lie for different parts of the world. Because the other problem is, yeah, because if you're comparing a tree, like Libby did the bristle tree prines up in North of America, well, who's to say the weather up there for good and bad years of growing trees was the same as ancient Egypt? Completely different climate. So they try and break it up in different areas, and this is where Alan Wilson gets quite annoyed, because you have, you know, if it's in Egypt, you have to add on 20% and all this kind of stuff. Come on, show me a graph. I'm sure there's graphs on here. This is all this stuff. Which I don't necessarily recommend reading all of it. Ah, here we go. Right. So, the, uh, which is this one now? Age corrected, colder than... God knows. Oh, this is a coral reservoir. Yeah, what they're doing on this paper is like, so we can look at coral, we can try and date it through coral, we can try and date it through lakes, through all sorts of things. Because they're desperately trying to find something to measure against. What's this? This is open open ocean estimates. We'll try matching to that curve. Nothing works. Then we'll try doing... What's this one? The data included four regions with large differences from a previous attempt. AD... Blah, 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 blah. All this kind of stuff. BP, by the way, means before present. So if it says 2000 BP, that's about the year zero. So none of these curves are smooth, all right? And they go up, they go down, they go backwards again. So you can even have a situation where you got more carbon uh, in a more recent time than a further back time. And people think this is all done. This is why I'm saying a bit about it. I've got a quarterly journal I get discussing the latest attempts to try and make it work. You know, um, it's an ongoing thing. Yet if you watch a news item or something, you'll say it's been carbon dated. You think, oh, brilliant, that's the answer. All right, so you have to get out. We all have to uh, realise... No, <laughs> it's not the answer, unfortunately. So we're going to get people saying, well, if we don't, if that doesn't work and dendrochronology doesn't work and none of these things work, what can we do? It's like, well, it's unfortunately, they don't work. They don't work. And we can't just pretend they work because we don't have anything better. So a lot of the time, you're going to have to try and use historical records, really. How else can you do it? All right, okay, so I just want to quickly... Um, I'll put little videos up in a week on this because I'm probably rambling on too long once I got into chron not chronology. But this is interesting. I like this. Uh, <laughs> this is, by the way, the British heritage. Oh, come on, Ross, do it properly. It is worth talking about quickly. Hang on, make sure I got this run up properly. Is this Chedworth? Oh, they got mixed up. He's mixed up my things. All right, I'll do that other one first, though, quickly. Because I like the quote as well. So what I, do, what I was trying to do as a little experiment for someone out there, one of you watching it now, you could do this, armchair research, is compare a lot of these British uh, mosaics and um, that are assumed to be Roman uh, and do a comparison with maybe ones in Italy, okay? So, for example, oops. I like about this one here. This is, this is the quote I really like at the bottom. When Pablo Picasso, one of my favourite artists, when Pablo Picasso commented that art is not truth, but rather a lie that makes us realise the truth. One, <laughs> honestly, someone's got a sense of humour, right? One assumes he wasn't musing about the artistic glories of late Roman Britain. It's, I want this framed on the wall in poster size. It's fantastic, because as you know, if you follow this channel, this whole idea of Roman Britain is pretty much a lie. Most of, I mean, there might be Romans here at some point. There's no way this was an island governed from Italy. That just wasn't the case. Maybe for 20 years or something. Um, even the even the official narrative, when you break it through, it, it's no way. There's like it's 400 years of Roman rule, that kind of thing. It just doesn't happen. So anyway, research during the past decade or oh, so suggests, however, that he could have been. The last century of Roman rule saw an artistic flourish that in intellectual terms arguably never been surpassed or something like that. 
The point is here, what they call the last century of Roman rule. Well, if you look at that last century, you can see moments like uh, Panassus usurping the empire uh, in the 280s. So when is the last century, what, what, what they're talking about? I mean, I would have thought they're talking about the 300s or from roughly 280 to 400 when they, you know, even the most ardent uh, pro-Roman would say that they've gone. So I would argue this is this flourishing of art, if their dates are correct, is uh, is quite a uh, is really a uh, testament to uh, British art, and that's how it should be treated. All right, okay. So there's another one here now. Ah, oh, this one I do have. Hang on. Whoops, sorry to mess you around a bit. Tuk tuk tuk. Okay, let's go to the website itself. Got a new keyboard. I'm learning where all the buttons are. Right, Britain's first known. And this ties it again, they see. First known 5th century mosaic. It gets weird, you see, because the Romans are supposed to have left 400, 409 officially. Unofficially, like I said. Whatever was left, 280s had gone. And according to Wilson and Blackett, by the time of 120, there's already a peace in place. Anyway, forget that a second. This is after the Romans. So, um... What's going on here? Unexpected result. <laughs> the dating shows that sophisticated life had continued within this luxury mansion decades after Britain ceased to be part of the Roman Empire and the country had entered the Dark Ages. So there's radiocarbon datings. Again, warning signs there could be a lot more recent or a lot older. Uh, but this is 5th century as far as they're concerned. Up until now, it's generally been believed that following the economic crash at the end of the 4th century, 380s presumably, all towns and villas were largely abandoned and fell into decay within a few years. Now, this is why this is important, okay? Why would these buildings suddenly decay? Why would people forget how to live in houses? Why is this bizarre idea that British people would rather live in a mud hut they live in a lovely villa with a hippocast and heating and beautiful mosaics and all this kind of stuff. What? Why? Why? You got these such earth lovers who want to live in a field. Well, let's look. Charcoal and bone sealed in a foundation trench in the North Range have provided radiocarbon dates that show the wall could not have been built. I'd love to know more details on that until after AD 424. And the mosaic must be later than this date. So let's go with their dates for a bit, all right? It's their game. Let's play their rules for a bit. This is clearly after the Roman, and they're building the mosaics. It is believed that the dated wall of the villa was constructed to subdivide an existing room and a mosaic. So they're managing to build walls, works of art, and everything after the Romans have gone. As in many floors where the central area saw more wall wear and tear, the best preserved parts around the edges. Right, okay, no problem. And you can go and see this apparently at Chedworth Roman Villa. Now, has anyone twigged what the key points are here? Is that, try and think about this. If they're still able to build walls, create mosaic floors, uh, do all these, oh, there's more of it. There we go. You can go to the site. Continued luxury. I'll not do all this now, but there we go. Uh, you can read about it. It means that these lavish villas were not degrading or anything. So why, why did it all suddenly come to a halt? And all these villas and amazing works of art destroyed. How can you explain that? This, this idea of dark ages and everything going to ruin as soon as the Romans left, it doesn't stand up. People are moving away from it. So isn't the logical thing, you have to think, well, why did all these villas and houses and the structure and the society and the towns suddenly fall apart? Enormously significant. Yes, it is, but not for the reasons they're giving. If they're still making mosaics and villas and houses and walls, what changed? What suddenly changed? Well, this is, if you look at the biggest event in, in British history, it's the comet, isn't it? It's the comet destroyed all this. That's why we suddenly had to go back to the beginning again. The comet destroyed everything. 
It's the only thing that fits the data and the logic. Is it something major catastrophe? So once again, we get back to what I was talking about earlier about the idea of catastrophism. We get a major event. And Velikovsky was really the one who brought a lot of this in, although before him, even Isaac Newton had questioned the, the chronology and the dating, particularly of places like ancient Egypt. And, and more and more uh, places are coming together to say that there's hundreds of years and thousands of years that shouldn't be there. See, this is where I think Wilson and Blackett, they're kind of in innocent. They're remarkably innocent. People don't realise. Because he does such brilliant work and they're so clever. They, they, they're not politicians. They don't have guile. I think it's one of the reasons it's got them into so much trouble. Uh, and Alan, when you read his books, like in uh, Moses and Hieroglyphs, which is brilliant on chronology, he talks there about, for certain areas like Egypt, when you date something, the R RCD, the radiocarbon dating, they add 20% to make it fit. It's more fundamental than that. They're not adding 20%, they just make him whatever fit, fit. The example, one of the examples, um, I'm going to sh I will try and do a separate video if I get a chance, trying to get these books out, uh, about that so-called Viking settlement in North America, is I think they had, Bob did the research, but I think it was nine samples, one of which they couldn't use because the tree rings didn't fit in with what they were trying to do. I mean, how could you do that? Okay, let's look at some of this now in a second. Oh, we got squirrel. The moving shade to the moving sun. Oh, okay, all right. I think I missed too much of that conversation. Neil Murray, I've noticed over my many years that the world play and sophistry is generally meaningless. Uh, okay. Lego, exactly, Ross. Why the hell would the luxurious British suddenly think wouldn't it be great if the Romans left us 20 years ago? Oh, well, it's raining everybody into a bottle and door but <laughs> I agree with this. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we need to disguise these words. You'll get thrown off it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please don't be putting too much political stuff on here. Nothing about viruses or jabby jabbies. None of that, please, because it will get thrown off. What we do then? Unfortunately, we are in sensorial times as our friends north of the border found. Right, so uh, that was that story there, really, okay? Here's one, right, definitely running miles behind. I was going to try and fish at 9 o'clock. It's gone now. We haven't even got to the main subject yet. So I'm going to have to do super... Look at all these books I've got here. <laughs> this is not going to happen, is it? There's a wonderful book here. Oh, God, I'll come back to this. Yeah, it does kind of tie in with this. Not really. I'm going to wangle it to tie in. This is one two days ago. Thank you, Christine Phipps, for sharing this on the Facebook group. If you find stories, please send them to me or put them on the Facebook group. It's very useful for this kind of thing. I'm not advocating you give all your personal data and information onto Facebook. But you can come on, just set yourself up with a name and share the discussion and information. It is very handy for that. We do have to use these tools, okay? Uh, right, so this is Anglo-Saxon gold coin discovered. I'll go through the full article. We'll do that another time. But what fascinates me about it... Is, oh, yeah, yeah, no, we're going to have to, because it's something about... It's completely bonkers, this article is. Oh, sorry, you're going to see me trying to find the right bits now. Ah, 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 please be here, please be here, please be here. Uh, hang on, let's get rid of that. Uh, old Masters. Come on, come on, there's the Flat Earth thing. Ah, yes, here it is. All right, not very slick this week. Uh, there's too much to cram in. It's just I'm just too much reading as well. I'm just I'm really it's it's so exciting at the moment. There's so much happening. Right, okay. Uh, Anglo-Saxon coin. Anglo-Saxon, right? This coin's supposed to be Anglo-Saxon. I'll sort of scroll it up so you can see above my head. Anglo-Saxon gold coin. This is just weird. All right, so they're going to go with a 650 to 670. Now remember these dates. You can pretty much pick a date if you're a professor. Okay. Oh, yeah, but one last thing I was going to say, the latching on with the curb. Professor Libby, back in the 50s, if you read about the history of radiocarbon dating, the history of it is as interesting as the history it's trying to work out. What he did, he needed some absolutely bang-on correct uh, points in history to anchor his curve on. So you can say, aha, this is from 1200 BC, 3,200 years ago. The carbon-14 level is this much. Therefore, anything with a similar carbon level will be 3,400 years ago. 
If only it was that simple, it would all be wonderful. The problem was, as you'll see, the items they dated to 1200 BC are nowhere near 1200 BC. So from day one, the system was screwed. And instead of, because uh, the scientists were going, hang on, I can't be right. You're telling us that this is 3,000 years old. But the carbon level's so low, that means the curve's got to be like this. We thought the curve would be like that. The curve's like this. So instead of the historians and the archaeologists bowing down and following the science, as we're all told to do, and, um, and adjusting their dates, which amazingly would have fitted Wilson and Blackett's dates, of course, in like the Moses book, they, they, they skewed the science. They, they, they fiddled, and they're still doing it. They're still calibrating it every so many years. That one's probably from 2020. I think that's where the 20 is for. And, and, um, or it's the 20th. I can't remember off the top of my head. But so all they, they keep moving these curves and the science to fit the dates that people have deduced. So it's, it, so it's not even that the right way around. Anyway, stop going on about that, Ross. What I want to show about this one, first of all, uh, if anyone's starting to look and to learn about coins on this channel, aren't we? I'd never looked at it before. New mass, new, was it? New massimus? Oh, come on, Marshall, what's the word? New massimus or something. A new <laughs> it's a word for studying of coins and things. Mr. A, Egyptians recorded Moses and his followers as the evil ones. Ooh, there's a stone describing this. Moses fled through a reed marsh but was saved by a tsunami. That's one way of looking at it. Wilson Black is a little bit different. Right, okay. Um, so we've got a Christian style cross. Anglo Saxon is not particularly Christian. This, if you look at the old coins, I would like to take this image and then twist it around and everything because they're very, very clever and very, very sneaky. So this way up, it looks like a face. And I bet if you turn that round, you might get a Cobra message here with that being a V and you get the different letters and the I's and the dots. It's a lot more to these coins. And the letters and everything. Immediately I thought, oh, that's early British. But apparently it's Anglo-Saxon. The cross is, is, this looks like, see this round here? Colburn, you see? See the writing? Could be Colburn, I should say. All right, let's look at it anyway. Let's, let's just, uh, uh, this, what does journalism become? When he turned it over and saw a male bust with a helmet, he started to shake. Well, I'm not sure if that's a helmet, but anyway, shaking away. Is there? It's almost like a voice in your head that tells you where to search. It's like, God, tell me how you dated it. Tell me some proper information. Oh, you're shaking and how muddy the field was. Right, okay. The legend includes runic test, which translated into Latin. See, they can't really translate it. But it's interesting, you see, because when you look at Colburn, the old British writing, segue to this wonderful book. Most expensive book I bought for a long time, because this is a genuine. Is it a hundred years old or something? Ancient Bards of Britain. Um, yeah, the Ancient Bards of Britain. This is by D. Delta Evans, and this seems to be the source book, which a lot of other books reference, including Wilson and Blackett. So in here, you've got the whole chapters here showing, for example, how the different alphabets were. Uh, worked out, you know, different, sorry, make it a bit bigger for you. How the different Colburn alphabets are put together, the different fonts, that kind of thing, and you can work from then then to work it out. The, the crucial bits from here, I, I want to double check, I'm overdoing it a bit, but that's the kind of thing that's going to be in, um, some of it's already in King Arthur Conspiracy, and there'll be an appendix and more about that in next, it's very, very important. Anyway, read this to me now, it's hilarious, okay? Uh, and what does it say? It describes the type. Oh no, I can't pass it. Um, first, it was a button. Oh no, it was a longer article. I think I've got to get the science article. Oh, blast. All right, it, yeah, here we go. Here it is. Here, here it is. Look at this. At the auction house, said the design was based on an obsolete Roman coin of the Emperor Crispus from the 4th century AD. Have you ever heard anything so bonkers? Am I going mad? Or have I missed the point here? So you got a coin found in 650, made in 650, this is by the way. They're saying it's made in 650. They're not saying the coin was 300 years old in 650. 
The coin dates from 650. In 650, they were making coins to look like 300 year old coins with an emperor from 300 years before. <laughs> How did they get away with that? It doesn't give. If anything, I was saying this looks earlier, it could even be pre Roman. And the cross, not all crosses are Christian, you know? Um, it could be. But it could be um, an earlier... So we're going to have a go at reading this anyway, Colburn. But what strikes you is all these stories, you never, ever, ever see the possibility that um, something's British never comes up. Isn't it weird? Isn't it weird? So there you go. It's an interesting one. Do more about it. Right. Thank you very much to uh, Mandy McCourt for this one. I have to go through it very quickly. Uh, this is more about uh, Care Mead. And if you look at it, it's the, the, uh, the British villa... What was it called? The Smoking Gun or something. This is one of the most viewed videos where Care Mead, only us, this is old spelling, slightly different version of it, slightly different description. And it's a history book. Oh, I can't remember the year. Uh, 1920s, I think. Anyway, its floors are tessellated and it seems some of the rooms were divided from each other by arches from which doubtless curtains were suspended. In the great entrance hall were the skeletons of about 30 men, women and children with cracked skulls. This place was attacked and destroyed. It's quite sad, actually, when you read some of the details. Um, I'll leave that on the screen so you can read it. I might do a separate little video on it. But what we're told that near Atlantic Major, there was Owen, a descendant of General Caradoc, had built a palace after the Roman style. And it's as certain as anything can be that this was the place... All circumstances point to the interference that this was one of those large buildings which is reduced to ashes in AD 420. And it's an old scene. So there we go. So uh, I just wanted to uh, ancient origins again. Ah, yeah, yeah. So this is... There was a theme. I did, it's, it's not just... You know, I'm not just thrown together these shows, you know. So this, this is the classic. This is the classic. So thank you to Christine Phipps for this one. Hang on, this is what I have to do. Hopefully, I've got the thing all queued up. No, no, hang on. I'm going to have to do this all from memory, I think, which is not a problem because I know this story very well. Oh, I thought I had that website already lined up. Hang on one second. Anyway, the point of this story is I'm going to try and lift that off there. Oh, I can do this, it's okay. I can just lift it off the screen. Is that. What's what's this dagger doing here? Okay, do you know this? Have you heard about this dagger? I think most people have heard of this. But this story keeps coming up. Um, all these buttons I'm pressing. The problem is right. This the dagger, as you can see there, it's it's iron. <laughs> it's an iron dagger, okay. But they found it in uh, King Tut, as they call it, Tutankhamun. It's a very confident date. Where did they put it? 1200, 1400 BC? Oh, here we go. So they put it 1330 to 13... Well, we are one year. They know exactly when he died. The year 1332, of course. Um, so that's the date. The problem is, right? <laughs> Iron is not officially recognised as being uh, produced... Until the Hittites, which might be the ancestors of the, of the Britons, by the way. Uh, you can read more about that. And not supposed to introduce iron uh, forging like this until the 600s. Slight problem. Six, seven hundred years gap. Now, coincidentally, because this came up today, or 22nd of February, look. So, thank you, Christine. So, uh, <laughs> this... You can see two fudges in one here. This is why this story, neither of which is mentioned, by the way. Two fudges. Actually, one's mentioned. When Libby was doing his, uh, only in the 1950s, by the way, RCD, uh, when he was doing his curve, he really needed some hooks to hang his things on. And one of the ones was this tomb. And this is one of the reasons why it's so massively messed up. Maybe it could work if they let the site run by itself and then put the history onto it. One of the problems with raging carbon date, it might actually be that it works fine. It works really well, but the history is so all over the place, it looks like it doesn't work very well. 
dendrochronology. I'm sorry, I think that's a pseudoscience with the trees. Because trees, even in the same field, they'll always grow the same speeds. So comparing trees in different continents, parts of the world, I'm, I'm only a lot of convincing. That's what I should absolutely say. Anyway, so we've got a problem here, right? How can this iron dagger be around 600 years before iron's uh, smelted? So they came up with this amazing idea. Uh, you might have heard of it. Meteorite iron. So it's, oh, what's happened is meteorites used to come and land with iron in them. And they take the iron out of the meteorite because they didn't realize. So a stone, uh, an iron bearing stone, you know, with the usual traces, the orange on it and everything like that. No one's thought of that. But the stone comes out of the sky, which will not look an awful lot different. Hey, let's take it to 2,000 degrees and see if we can make a, a dagger out of it. They get away with this. They absolutely get away with it. When you read Moses and the Hieroglyphs, I highly recommend there's some scams in there like Tanis. We got one building, another building clearly pushed, built on top of it because the first ones had a bit of wall knocked down. They messed up the planning or something. So you got the corner actually goes over the old building. Except this one. The one that's being built over is from a later dynasty than that one. How can how can that possibly be? So the same here as example. You see Wilson and Blackett, but because it's not me working this out here. This is fairly well known example. Wilson and Blackett talk about it. Was there? Oh, we're talking about Moses there. I was going to do Moses tonight actually. Perhaps we we'll do Moses next week. Okay. The story of Moses, the life of Moses, is different to what you think. His life as a general and a warrior and different wives and all that kind of stuff. It's very good. If you haven't read Moses and Hieroglyphs, it might be new to you. So what you do is you invite this idea that they can use um, meteors. There's enough metal or meteors to make a dagger, which is why they're incredibly uh, precious and a gift worthy of a king. But now they're saying, hang on a second, he wasn't, what's the, what's the headling? This is quite funny. It was not made in Egypt. It's still got to be forged, you see. This is the thing. It's still got to be forged. Even if it's meteoric iron, it's the same process. If you can do this in... Th 30, what did they say? 1332? If you can do this in 1332, with something that falls from the sky, do you really think it would take another 600 years before someone goes, that stone over there looks a bit like it. I wonder if we raise that up to 2,000 degrees, it might work. No one thought of it. It's like 600 years. And this is the only iron dagger, apparently, in the whole world, just from a meteor or from this, there's a few meteors. So the problem is, if I have more and more daggers, like, ah, oh, God, there's loads of these around. Um, conclusion, lots of meteors. <laughs> it's just, so this, this site is brilliant. So we've got the, um, the carbon dating does, one of the reasons it does not work is because this site, because uh, Alan Wilson uh, shows very convincingly, very convincing evidence that it's um, around about 600s, right? <laughs> so we, we are like a long way out. Suddenly you put it in the 600s, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, maybe even radiocarbon dating might suddenly work if you move the curve from 1200 down to 600 and suddenly you get a bit more reasonable you don't get these graphs doing this you might get a graph doing that it would be a really interesting exercise if someone's um <laughs> I don't know if you, as it would be that difficult there's a project uh, to think about is that yeah try and create um a nice simple uh, decay curve for radiocarbon 14 on elements all right it's a simple curve and then, uh, how do you get all the results? What we have to try and do is find the raw data of how they date items and put them where they should go on the curve according to if it was a perfect curve and see what history we get. I think that would be really interesting. So this this little thing here, this dagger, is, is it like this. <laughs> you might be stabbing people, but it's actually a smoking gun, all right? That's the great thing about it, because it, it, it shows many things it shows how imaginative historians and archaeologists can be if their dates don't fit the evidence um that's something that um 
Jim Michael writes a lot about O parts, isn't it? Uh, objects outside there, you know, where they should be. And also it shows you how stubborn, I would say, so stubborn about not shifting the date. They're even prepared to change the science of how radiocarbon dating works, or doesn't now work, to fit with this. I mean, it's 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 that bonkers. <laughs> this is why this is why I had uh, such a great experience. I don't know, it's mind blowing. I mean, to tell you a little bit about my own background, if you like. I mean, I was um, Mr. Square on it. You know, I was working in exhibitions. Uh, I had an exhibitions company on the Middle East. Did exhibitions there, and I I just none of this. I loved history my whole life. I studied it, and I get people, uh, particularly academics, saying. Um, well, well, you know, you can't just come up with these themes. You got to, you got to appreciate the work that's gone beforehand. Yeah, I do. I spent decades studying it and Egypt, Egyptology and the standard methods, and suddenly you get that Wilson and Blackett moment, like like um, that interview on the Edge or Wilson and Blackett on um, Rich Planet, which a lot of us saw first. And you suddenly go, "Hang on, they might be right." And the more you look into it, you find they are right. And then once the bubbles burst, you can't go back and unsee that in all the stuff we're taught, you know, a bit upside down. Okay, so quick one there, show Rob's, Rob Shaw's put another video up. <clears throat> it's about this Robert Cecil. A bit more recent than we normally do, but he does tie in with his excellent book, Architecture of Power. So if you're looking for something to watch on Tinternet, that's fairly just straight up history, I'll give that a go. Someone's coming in with an open mind rather than just reading out of the book of what we're meant to think. All right, Celts, that's going to go on to, wasn't it? Too late to do it in detail now. Like 25 past nine. Oh my goodness, on a school night. Oh no, all these references and stuff to read. And I have to come back to it. <clears throat> oh, I even have Moses ready with bits from there to read about carbon dating. And... Oh, right. I was never going to squeeze it all in. I'm sorry about that, folks. How was people doing anyway? Sorry it's a bit late, but I do need to get everyone to bed, including me. So got tomorrow morning, I'm going to do my uh, walk around Kate's Park. Not Kate's Park. Next to the castle, all right? Um, Pewter Park. Apologies. Right, okay, I do want to just read this. Right, okay. This has come up again this week, so I'm going to bring it up on here, as I promised to quite a few people I would. So the first thing I'll do, I'm going to have to do it very quickly. This Celtic myth, okay? So here we go. Wikipedia. Ah! Sorry, I thought I was on the website. I'm not on the website. I'm still on there. Nope, I'm going to get the hurry up. Say, why my little boy got to bed yet? I'm going to have a bad parenting as well. Right, okay. By the way, very useful F11 button if you never use it. If you want to get things to fill the screen, you haven't got all the stuff around the edges. Okay, so this is the official. Now, I, I, I'll tell you, I'm only going to do about this official. I'm not going to go through the Wilson Blackett thing. Most of you probably here before anyway. I'm going to bring things to an end after this. But it struck me because someone's, um, <clears throat> some poor person's got a master's in Celtic studies and it's like a bit painful for them when they hear that, you know, well, actually, there's no Celts or Celtic people in Britain or Ireland, and the whole thing is an invention, 1700s. And this map is interesting, because you kept referring back to this map, and the dark green bits, funny enough, are the kind of old Britain areas. You can still see them there, uh, from the migrations and everything, because they're, you know, the British invaded, in the 280s, invaded Brittany, that's what it's called, Brittany, Britain. The language, Britain, Breton, Britons. This is, they went that way. Unfortunately, conventional wisdom is everything goes east to west. And I'm going to have to do more on this at another time because what Wilson and Blackett were writing and talking about 20, 30 years ago is now happening. And it's always nice and powerful when you see something like that. <clears throat> right, so what I want to just point about here. Oh, God, there's so much text on this. It's so ugly. Um, so you've got the old... Uh, you've got different theories about where Celts came from, right? Grouped together by their Celtic languages. Historic Celtic groups include these bunch, which have all been sort of looped together. The relationship between here, yeah, the relationship between ethnicity, language, and culture in the Celtic world is unclear. I bet it is, and debated. For example, over the ways in which Iron Age people on Ireland should be called Celts or not. Right, now there's a few things in here. So I should have made better notes. Right, a newer theory is Celtic from the West. So somewhere that it just magically appeared in the Atlantic. I don't know, it come out the sea or something. Atlantic coastal zone. 
again, they just will not acknowledge the idea that their own records state that the language and the people migrated from the Middle East up and round to here. Uh, oh, there was, oh, no, come on, I've got to find this. Yeah, elements of Celtic mythology recorded in early Welsh Irish uh, literature. Most written. Ah, I know it is. Here we go. Right, names and terminology. Here we go. This is the bit I wanted. Sorry. Right, here we go. Right, here we are. Right, okay. Sorry if it's a bit small. Um, I'll read it anyway. <clears throat> so the first recorded use <coughs> of the name of Celts as Keltoi in Greek ref to refer to an ethnic group was made by Hecateus of uh, Miletus, Greek geographer, 517 BC. I almost swore then. Uh, it's unlikely it's from 517 BC. I've got to do the burst in the bubble of all these, everything's Greek. That's that's high on the list. Oh my goodness, so many great subjects. I know some of these channels have real problems getting contact, don't we? <laughs> and here, I, we could do this every week for the next 20 years and we still won't even get through a tenth of what Wilson and Black had done. It just amazes me. And it's not just their work, it's the doors they open and get you thinking, all right? That's what you do is don't think, look at information and think, hang on a second, what are they, what are they really saying? Right, okay. Now, listen to this though, this surprised me. He was writing about a people living near Massilla, modern Marseille. So the Romans were referring to the Celtii in southern France, Wilson Blackett talk about it in southern France. It's even there. They're talking about people in southern France. 5th century Herodotus, around the head of the Danube. It seems to be they migrated up towards uh, Germany. This is the key line. Far west of Europe. It does not say islands. It does not say Britain. And it's conflation to try and make that sound like Britain. But then, um, that's it. And then what you'll find there, go through all this, where's the bit about, here we go. Celt itself is a modern English word first attested in 1707. Right, and we've got loads of really good sources. You can argue this all day, but if you're stuck with a situation with someone, you can send them to the wiki page. Well, have a look at it. Have a look at what wiki says. It's not, it doesn't say. It tells you. It's there. All right, the word is pretty much invented 1707. It's all to do with the rewrite. So in the writing of Edward Lloyd, Welshman, who did great stuff the Welsh language, I don't necessarily blame him, by the way, because as with, I've noticed this a lot, he made a discovery and he died very young, and then his discovery gets used. Same with Champollion, with the hieroglyphs. They very conveniently disappear off the scene, and then their work, I think, gets twisted and misused to paint a different picture. So I'm not sure it would have gone this direction if it wasn't, if Edward Lloyd had stayed alive longer. Okay, so you're talking about early Celtic inhabitants again. Again, no one's talking about um, Celts coming from Britain, really. The English form Gaul and Gaulish, Galois, all these things. And then you got where Welsh comes from and all that, which I think that might be wrong as well. Welsh might be an ancient word. So before we throw it out completely, <laughs> let's have a look at it. All right, so you can read this. One, 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 try to get across the point here. It's when you read something, don't just assume it's there. Because I kind of assumed it's going to have something about Celts in Britain. It doesn't, actually. And even this map, so I'll blow it up. No, it doesn't blow up very well. All right, let's not bother blowing it up. If you read it, distribution of Celtic peoples over time in the traditional view. It's it's That view's going. It's on the way out. It's being revised. And the curious thing here, what are these things here? See, this core Hallstatt territory, there is no trace of the language or anything. Um, ah. Right, see, the problem, you've got two different things now. We're talking about Celtic languages, Welsh, uh, Ireland to a certain extent, Manx, Ma um, Isle of Man, Cornish, Breton, you know, Kernu, Breton, Manx. All those languages, as you can clearly see where they are, they aren't over here. We got this Romance idea, which might be a connection to the ancient British, near to where Monica is. But this idea the Hallstatt said, there's not a trace anywhere 
of the Celtic language in any of these areas, or the people at all. The whole theory is based on this diffusion. You know, diffusion or migration. Well, where's the migration? Where's the migration? Where's the evidence for it? You go through all this. There's no... And it's, it is unclear. Unclear and debated. Hang on a second. Ah! Oh, no, I just clicked on the reference. By the way, you get references in, in Wikipedia. This is where you want to be looking, all right? When you click on something, have a look where it takes you. Like John Collis, for example. I've just started reading this book, The Celts' Origins, Myths and Inventions. Can we go back up to 113? Ah, it's just really talk about it, what he does. But anyway, John Collis is very interesting. Here's another in interesting map. It shows Celtic Britons. Just checking. You can see this okay yet? Picts and Irish. Interesting gales. Um, <laughs> this, 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 this could be like a week of discussion, just that one map. I like the colours as well. I don't mean the colours of the rugby jerseys. And then the English would come in and take this little bit of the East Coast here, I would suggest. And then some of these have gone over to that form of government or whatever happened, that kind of thing. Right, now in, um, it even tells you here, look, there's a bit more here. Sorry to, horrible pile of text. Sorry about that. Anyway, like many Celtic peoples on the mainland, the insular Celts, all right, so they, they mean British when they say that, ancient Celtic religion, there's another problem because they are constantly mixing up two things. You've got the Celts referred to by the Greeks and the Romans, their Druidic practices, their beliefs, all this kind of stuff. We were in the south of France. And then you've got the Celtic languages, completely different. We talk about British people and their influence going across into Europe. So you can see here, some of the British tribes had strong links with Gaul and Belgica and minted their own coins. <coughs> During the Roman occupation of Britain, a uh, Roman of British culture emerged in the southeast. The Britons and Picts in the north and the Gales of Ireland remained outside the empire. I would say they're most of Western England, Cornwall, Wales, north of England. <laughs> but anyway, during the Rome, uh, during the end, how can you have during the end? You have at the end. Uh, at at the end, in the four hundreds, there was significant Anglo-Saxon settlement. So they're trying to squeeze the British out. By bringing Anglo Saxons forward, Romans further back, and some Gaelic settlement at the western coast. Right, some type, right, it's here as well. Here we go. During this time, some Britons migrated to the Armorican Peninsula, where their culture became dominant. What they mean by that is Brittany. It's all there. It's all there. None of this is being made up. You read the Wilson and Blackett in that, it's all there. It just isn't allowed to exist for the political reasons. Like I say, at the very beginning, talking about Taiwan, when you've got Chiang Kai-shek, has to be everywhere, and now he can't be anywhere, depending if you've got the Greens or the Blues in charge, and that kind of stuff. And I will like to just read this little bit from... All my bookmarks in. Before we go to bed, because my goodness, it's getting... Oh, damn man, I, I can feel like I could talk all night tonight. Oh, no, no, no. This is from... Chapter 10. Oh, I know what I was going to do. Put it on the screen. That's better, isn't it? Hang on. Uh, oh, God. I've got to remember which buttons to press. Got that. I can't. Bear with me a second. Yeah, a little sneak preview. Chapter 10. Just come back with proofing. Thank you again, um, uh, Marshall. Right, so I'm going to read a little bit of this now. Uh, there's John Collis, all right, 1984. He was doing his stuff, got one of his books. It, it's very interesting. Half right. <laughs> he does a good job of showing how the constant, the current thinking is nonsense. All right, so here's the next. It's the myth of Celtic and Roman Britain, one of my favourite chapters. You might not be surprised to hear that. So in order to even begin to understand ancient British history, it's first, can you see this? You can. Necessary to slay some fearful dragons that terrorise and bewilder the academic mind. Oh, I love the way they write. The myth of the dragon of Celts. Can I go full screen with this? No, I can't do this one. Uh, the myth of the dragon of Celts and the myth of the Roman dragon must be put down. Without even a cursory examination of any of the evidence available, British university employees routinely propound 
that the ancient Welsh, the Scots, and even the Irish were Celts. In 1994, Professor John Collis of Sheffield University Archaeology Department spoke at a conference in Cardiff on Celts in Europe and stated that none of these people were Celts, which is precisely what Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett have been saying for many years. They were starting to say this in the 80s. I mean, it's so far ahead. And I do think they're going to ca we're catching up. I think, like I say, it's going to be a big breakthrough year. The whole year doesn't, world doesn't stop. <laughs> if we carry on going, we're going to break through, break out. There is a widespread assumption that in the Iron Age, much of Northern and Central Europe was occupied by the Celts. Yep, it's assumed that they shared a culture and were a people. It's also assumed that today, go away, remnants of the Celtic people survive in the modern societies, Scotland and Wales, Ireland and Brittany. These assumptions are flawed in every respect. There was no pan-European Celtic people, there was no broad-based Celtic art society or religion, and there never were any Celts in Britain. All right, it could be much clearer than that. A brief correspondence with Professor Collis, they were in touch with each other back in the day, had his expressions of regret they even broached the subject as it, whoops, sorry, as it proved to be extremely unpopular news to university employees. Wilson and Blackie could well imagine how this revelation of truth might have shaken their revered creeds and dogmas. <laughs> doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't help us make friends with the academic community. Of the static, moribund and stagnant religion of archaeology to its very foundations. Fortunately, Professor Collis persisted and published a book in 1999. Now, as I'm a little bit too thorough with doing these books, I bought that book and I'm reading it. it it's not the easiest read, I have to say, but it's very good stuff. So in 1993, Collins said... Collis said that should be. Oh, oh, that end shouldn't be there. Proof that one. Right, no ancient author ever referred to the inhabitants of Britain, the Brittany, as Celts. It was not until the 18th century that the term was applied to Britain, and it was used to denote a group of languages spoken in Western Britain and Brittany. This is Collis now, not Alan Wilson. By the 19th, see the different font. By the 19th century, the concept of the national Celts was well developed and applied to Britain. This extension is confused and illogical and brings us into direct conflict with the ancient sources. The archaeological basis for claiming a cross European Celtic society is equally illogical. Indeed, the whole notion of an archaeological culture defined by material remains, in my view, flawed. All right. And this is the idea. Uh, I want to do the jump forward now. It's the, um, the whole concept of the Hallstatt thing and the Latin culture and all that. If you find a pot here and a pot there and they're similar, these people must be related. I mean, it's bonkers, you know. If I'm producing... Uh, <laughs> I'm living in sunny Italy and I'm producing wine and olive oil and I trade you a few amphoras for your British tin or gold or whatever it is, these amphoras, the jars, are going to end up in Britain, aren't they? Of course they are. I mean, it's, how else is it going to, stuff going to get moved around? Uh, they don't think about the contents of the jars. They just think about the bloody jars. And uh, the same with the metal coming the other way, isn't it? How else are you going to continue it? Anyway, getting very late now. But uh, just jumped ahead 20 pages. You can read a lot more about this, all about the Roman myth. A lot of stuff I show in there. Uh, these these uh, videos and stuff. Right, anyway. Just, this, just finish with this a second. Uh, as we get down as far as... Yeah, actually, I do want to read this bit. Right, the British stem from two major ancient migrations. The first from Chaldean Syria around 1600 BC and the second from Israel. From Israel? Via Assyria and Asia Minor embarking in 504 BC. It follows that the British were not and are not Celtic. Therefore, it becomes equally... Logical that the ancient British religion has nothing whatsoever to do with the religion of the Celts who dwelt in southern France. I did some short videos showing the Druidism they describe, you know, the sacrifices, chopping off heads, all that stuff, was not writing about Britain. Oh, I, no evidence that Britain ever did those things. Maybe they did, but that's not what was described in the writing. So the fact the 11 Roman and Greek writers had described the Druid religion of the Celts of southern Gaul had only minimal knowledge of Britain. Yeah, why do we give so much credence to Roman and Greek writers who never, ever, ever came to Britain? This is where the Celts were, between the rivers Sequana and Garuma, now called the Seine and the Garonne. There is no evidence whatsoever 
of a blood link, cultural link or religion link. The Roman and Greek writers who described the Celts of Gaul were Strabo, Caesar, Siculus, um, Cicero, Pliny, Pomponius, read all these names, and none of them actually went to Britain. Okay, this is the point. Tacitus, who I think might be um, a Renaissance fraud anyway, but like I said, Wilson and Blackett are, are innocent types. They, they just follow the written information as it is. They don't think, oh, maybe Tacitus is a complete forgery for Renaissance times. But even there, even from what he's written, the internal evidence, there's loads of problems with his work, okay? <laughs> and this is Polio talking about Caesar. How many times do you go onto a history site or discuss history of people and they talk about uh, Gallic wars with Caesar being like this Bible, this font, this little feathers of truth drifting down from heaven and being passed on by the wonderful Julius Caesar, this lovely man who just wanted to pass on truth and knowledge to other people and didn't have a political bone in his body, apparently. But that's not what the Romans said at the time. <laughs> See, Alan Wilson's funny. Uh, held the opinion the assertions of Julius Caesar were not always reliable. <laughs> he puts it so nicely. Right, anyway, oh, do we get the violin ready? I'm just wrapping up now. So Asinius Polio, Polio thinks that they, Caesar's works, were composed with little accuracy and little truth. Since Caesar used to believe rashly concerning the deeds by other men and also to rate erroneously the things done by himself. So we've got this editing software. Or through failure of memory. Failure of memory, I love that. And he is of the opinion that he intended to rewrite or correct them. I mean, that is really, really damning. He's like, he made a few slips he was going to correct later. So, um, anyway, so there's loads more on that, loads more on that, loads more on that. Okay, but for tonight, didn't get to the last topic. Can't remember what the last topic was now. I've got loads of slides left. I won't show the slides. I'm just going to whiz through. Maybe we'll do them next week. So, Celts. Oh, yeah, King Arthur Conspiracy. The pre-orders are ready. You can buy the book. Just go to cumroglyphics.com. Yeah, I've got to show that, haven't I? Hang on. <laughs> ah, give the ducks a bit plug. It'll be out soon. And then you'll have to pay the full price then once it's out. Uh, all right, I'll show, you the whole, I'll show you the whole process. Here we go. So we type in uh, camroglyphics.com. Oh, there it is, right at the top there. You just click on that, or you can go to books. Here's the books. It's growing the range, isn't it? Oh, yes, yeah, Titanic Protocol. I, I, I can get copies of that. I have got copies. I don't like the topic or the name or the cover. You know, I'm a bit sensitive sometimes. All right, that's all about the dirty business with MI5 and all that, which I'd rather not think about, really. I didn't really want it on our website, even. Okay, there's Hugh Evans's book, Origins of the Zodiac. There's Robert Shaw, Architecture of Power. Here's New King Arthur. You just click on it, and then you can pre-order and you get the discounted price, which is both both volumes of 45 instead of £30 each, okay? So there you go. Plus shipping, of course. Uh, and that'll be out soon. Hang on, what else are we going to talk about? Oh, there's loads of stuff. Oh, well, there's an after pass tonight. Oh, yeah, I've just done that. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. All right, okay. Which Prince Malik? Oh, yeah, we need to do Which Prince Malik. Sorry. Um, yeah, Prince Malik. I have to do the Which Prince Malik next week. And I'll go straight in. Less news next week. But I thought it, it, it was good to all, especially with a lot of new people joining, just to refocus what the channel's doing, uh, how the chronology, and how we got to question what we're taught as things which are absolute facts and absolute truths which uh, hypotheses usually quite easily uh, disproved all right arnie b what are you going to give us mate and thank you all the patreons oh, and youtube oh did, were you reading it really yes i didn't really see any oh no suggestions all right arnie what are you going to play you're looking a bit tired but when you play one of your favorites when do you know um what's that lovely um what's it mozart's always nice isn't it or do you do um something welsh oh, Oh, we're stuck. We're stuck in indecision. Because I only walked in when the show started. And we can't do it yet on the one I like doing, can we? Because it doesn't work on violin. All right, well, I thank anyway. Thank you very much to Patreon supporters and members. Just a couple of pounds a month each, please. We've had some very generous gifts. So I'm not begging and we're not short of money. And we, with the pre-orders, we could pay for the print run, okay? Uh, we do make an income at some point. But anyway, it's not panic, all right? We've got some, you know, whatever, savings and things. And what I really like if people could put two pounds each in, rather, I mean, I'm like, you know, uh, being saved by a few members 
giving what I would consider very large, generous gifts to keep this thing going. Which I'm, they, don't, they want to stay anonymous. I'm extremely grateful. It does mean we can get the books printed early and things. Uh, but just, just if people just put in two pounds each a month, it's not much really, you know. It's about seven p a video or something, and it helps keep this going because this is our history, it is our past. No one's doing this to become millionaires or make money or anything like that. It's just to get the stuff out there, and if we can get, you know, more regular income, we can start to get more people involved and I don't know, let's try and get this happening. Because I'm very aware how many years left of um, <laughs> this. I don't sound depressed. I'm not, not depressing. All right. We don't live forever. And you start with the number of years you got left of active, productive work. Number of books, amount of work needs to be done. You're not quite fitting in at the moment, all right? So if you want to do something, I'm very happy to give stuff out. Like, for example, I just want to clarify quickly. I spoke down about this the other day. When I mentioned doing a musical of King Arthur, I have done the synopsis. I've done all the scenes. I've even written a couple of the tunes. But if you're musical, and I'm not musically trained or anything, you could play to it. Yeah, you start playing on if you like. Yeah, that'd be nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a bit of Mozart then. Go on, yeah. That'd be, let's, let's go for that. If you want to take that project on, you can have the project, all right? I, I'm like, whatever the opposite of copyright is, I'm like, do it, have it, free. I'll help you as much as I can. I'll help you get the venue. I'll help the whole thing. I didn't book the venue. This, I, When I'm introducing all these ideas, they're not just to distract me, it's to give people a chance to run it, you know? And you could come up with new ideas and change it a bit. Uh, in fact, anyone who asks me, I will send you the Word document with a synopsis of the play and how it works and everything. For example, uh, same with some of the other projects, with writing anything, really. We've got to all get involved in this, all right? It's really, really important. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm I, just, like I said, I'm just the chopsy one out front, all right? This is Britain's Hidden History, not the Ross Broadstock Show, okay? So please, and all those people who help with the editing and, and proofing, and convert in Alan's PDFs in the Word documents that we can edit, make into books. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You will all get your names in the book when it comes out. For that will be there forever. Your name will be there. Show your grandchildren. Look, I helped save some British history. There's my name in the contributors. All right. So there we go. So till the next time, I right, give you some welly then, Arnie B. And I say goodbye to a few people. Hope you enjoyed that tonight. My goodness, almost ten o'clock. Do you know, tonight I was going to do a one hour show, but I was like, one hour, one hour, one hour, one hour, one hour. Go up to one hour, one hour, one hour. And I have all this stuff to show. <laughs> Bit of Welsh anthem. No, I'm not singing it. I sang it yesterday. Still sad. I was uh, reading this, which is Jim Michael. And that's, that's all about Maddock and everything in there. Brilliant, brilliant book. And that ties in with Wilson the Blackett's work and those other things. And the bards. I can't even read all the books. And then tomorrow I'm going to be on the park talking about... Uh, don't forget, I want to catch up and say hello. Nice to see you. Right, I'll try and catch up on some comments. Well, Arnie plays the Welsh anthem. Nice to see you, Thank you, Jaden. Great show, Arnie. Thank you. Arnie plays so Dad won't sing. <laughs> Thank you, Paula. I can sing to the violin, all right? Excellent. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Right arm, you're going to get to bed, man. It's 10 at 10. Pwah. Never be up so late on a Sunday. School the next day. Right, so I'll, I'll leave the comments open for a few minutes so people can say goodbye to each other and that kind of thing. And um, also, I like to have a little look through the comments. And if you are looking back on this, there's loads of clever people in the comments with loads of information and knowledge. And it's actually a good read. And, I, and if there's anyone technical out there, I'll tell you something you can do to help. Maybe there's someone who could have, um... What's that? It's elevator music for the background. Elevator music for the background. I <laughs> quite a bit more elevator music. Hey, I'll give you a challenge. Ali, I'll give you a challenge. Yep. Or you can do it on the keyboard, just showing off. I'll give you a challenge. Yes. I would like, and you haven't practiced it, I don't think you've played it before. Yes. By ear, the Rocky music. Because he watched the Rocky films the other day. <laughs> That's it. A bit, bit more uplifting. If you're good at the technical stuff, can you please show me? There's, um, I've noticed these YouTubers, they have two screens set up when they're doing the streaming. So you got that I can share the information on one screen and I can um, read the comments on the other one. If you know how to do that and you can tell me or even do it, that'd be great. I think I've got another screen somewhere. 
just, just please. Because <laughs> it's quite difficult doing it like this, right? <clears throat> yeah, very good, huh? I like that. It's a bit of rocky music. There we go. Especially going to bed. Right, okay. So, good night, everyone. I really am going to go now. So, I have to... Um, oh, I was going to say last week's show. So, the wrong graphic's going to come up. But I'm going to say my usual thing, which is peace to everybody. Particularly at a time like this. Uh, peace. And I'll look out for a video in a week. And you can see a Welshman called Hughes actually um, set up the city now called uh, Donetsk, which is in Ukraine. <laughs> so they are. The Welsh uh, helped create this uh, current situation we got going on. <laughs> All right, it's not really a laughing matter, I know, but uh, the Welsh connection is quite amusing to think we cause in. Uh, set this thing up 200 years ago and it's coming back to bite us. So there you go. Till the next time. And my love and best wishes, Hedwig. I gotta change the graphic. Quick, quick, quick! I can change the graphic. Oh no, Leon's done it. Yeah. Ah, microphone's still on, Leon. Well done, mate. You, 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 you updated it to the right graphic. Well done. I have a quick look at the comments. Mindy Kuski now back. Mindy Gwelly. Alright, let's go a quick scroll. Oh, up Kevington. Has anyone explored using. F Sorry, I'm just going to get a little bit of extra bit without my face or anything. Has anyone explored using family genealogies to investigate or verify royal genealogies in history? What an excellent, interesting question. I think quite a few have done that. But I'm not tying it in exactly with the royalty. Because they're. Genealogies is something that uh, Alan Wilson shows is a very important way of tracing, uh, particularly Welsh history. The Welsh are mad about genealogy. Didn't even have surnames, you know, you're the son of, son of, son of, very much like the Bible. And interestingly, very much like the Roman emperors and that would do. You know, you see those long, long, long names where they're basically listing ancestors. <coughs> yeah, I wonder who the original Britons were. Yeah, well, we got yeah, we got one of these amazing figures. Who's this from? Dark Commission, four hundred four hundred thirty thousand years ago. There we go. I I, I I'm, I'm skeptical of that figure, but I, I I'm very open to the idea that uh, some people we hear are very ancient. Uh, yeah, who was here before the ice? Yeah. The Bible's all about us. I think you're right, Brad. I think it is. Is Arnie still awake? Can we hear some more good music? Yes, we just did. Thank you, Sherry. Nothing new. World War Two. Oh God! Don't go to World War Two. By the rivers of Babylon. <laughs> ah, good call, Gary. We'll have that next week. I will sing some Boney M. I love that song. By the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down, every way, and I remember Zion. But you baby, tell baby, come to be. Captivity ba, 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 ba. How come we sing our songs in a strange land? Something like that, wasn't it? Marco Guy, yeah, look at Marco. I think you find him as Marco Siluris, perhaps, or Siluris 2020. He keeps getting kicked off YouTube. Ah, <laughs> uh, Marco, and if you are watching, I need to come and see you. We haven't seen each other for ages. I've taken Marco a few sites at the Lionstone and places like that. Very interesting reaction as well. Uh, I've got a violin play here, Dark Commission. Man would ask me if I could play Far, Far Away. Far, Far Away, which song is that? The only one I know is, no. Far, Far Away. Don't know the tune. It, it rings a bell, I can't think of it. I just realised I'm almost whispering here and I still come through very loud, don't I? So I'll talk quieter in the future. Uh, what else we got? If you look at the Hapola groups, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't do the, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I, one area I don't really get into is DNA and, uh, and I'm not, I'm a little bit sceptical about DNA, I'm sorry, I know, I don't talk about it much. I know a lot of people are uh, fascinated by DNA and thinks it shows everything. I've, I, 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 don't share that view at the moment, although I am open to be persuaded, and I don't know enough about it. 
<laughs> to really comment. <laughs> I think it's more useful for populations than for individuals, but there you go. I, I, I know Alan Wilson's quite keen on it. Because one of the things that Jim Michael would like to do as well, which I was going to talk about, is the ultimate experiment would be to um, track down the blinking jawbone, which I think they uh, might have lost in the Smithsonian, or misplaced, or can't find, whichever way you want to look at it. Take DNA for near and compare it to DNA of one of the known royals of that era, buried, say, in Lander Cathedral, Myrig or something. Two drink, one of those. Let's see if the DNA matches. So that'd be quite a cool, wouldn't it? And uh, but uh, thirty years ago, I don't think any progress has been made on that. And we don't have Jim Michael anymore. But uh, right, there we are. I really am going to go now and plug my microphone. So I shall say goodnight again. So uh, no star pope and uh, headuch. <laughs>